Okay, just in case. So, hello, Emily. Good morning. Oh, it's afternoon for you. It is. Yeah, it's like two thirty. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, good afternoon, doll. Um, first, I want to tell you thank you for agreeing to come and having this live chat in the secret yeah. circle. Um, and I wanted, you know, the opportunity for people to come and be able to ask questions if they have any. Um, but there was so much about your story that, you know, you just couldn't fit into an hour. So mm. it's like, let's keep talking. Yes. I'm all about it. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things um, that I wished we could have talked about more, which we can now, is um, just your transition. Like, again, it takes so much courage to do that. But the reason I wanted to have this chat is because there's so many people even here in this group um, who are either starting out with their practice or in that space of how do I transition from this to that. And a lot of people do, like they build their practice while they're still in their um, more traditional job. So I wanted to ask you about that. Did you do that? Yeah, I actually, it's funny because I had been doing, when I was doing my social work job, I actually did Reiki in my home. Mm -hmm. So I was having people come in and I was doing donation only because I didn't know how much to charge. Like I didn't know how much people were willing to charge in my area. And I think a lot of times too, it depends on your area, obviously. So yeah. I did that for about a year and then my husband has a, an art studio and gallery space. So I told him, I said, I want to rent an office space. So I, I literally rent office space for my husband. <laughs> and I, you know, I just said, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I have a feeling that this is going to work. And so he was like, okay. Um, so I, Again, I was doing my social work job. I was doing Reiki on top of my social work job, like as my, I call it like my side hustle. Right. So I was doing that for a while. And then, then I eventually like quit my job when I knew that I could get clientele coming in. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I actually, that's what I recommend to people a lot of times when they're in that space. I'm like, you should really like take advantage of the steady paycheck while mm -hmm. you try to build up your clientele on the side. And then you'll know when it feels like something that's more feasible to do. Right. Yes. yes. Yeah. So I have to ask you this too. Is it um, different than what you expected it to be like working for yourself and doing this practice? Yeah. This yes. All the yeses. I honestly, for me, it was like, Oh, well, when I start my own business, I have all the freedom in the world, which is great. It is a beautiful thing to have that freedom. But I think when you're running your own business, sometimes we tend to overwork ourselves a little bit more than having an eight to five. Right. Or, you know, whatever the typical thing is. So I think it's just really finding boundaries for yourself. Like that's something I do have a hard time with because I'm a big people pleaser. I love helping people, but it's recognizing a, what your niche is, who, who you're serving, how much you're charging. Because you, my big thing is I used to want to fix everybody mm -hmm. and you can't, like right. you just cannot do that for yourself. So that was one of the big things. Yeah. It's interesting. You say that it was, um, similar for me. And I think for me, it was more of like a, I guess it was like a guilt at first, you know, like if I knew people needed support with something yes. and I knew that I had tools or I could hold space, regardless of what was going on with me, it was like, oh, okay, I'm going to show up for them, you know? And it actually, it took a toll on me and I hit a point where I was like, either I have to do this differently or I just can't do this anymore. So I had to be more rigid with myself about like, okay, these are the hours that I work. These are, you know, times where I need to take time for myself. And that's another big part in this. So have you noticed, um, or what do you do, I should say, with like balancing taking care of you and also holding space for other people? Yeah, I, I really do try to, in the morning, I have a very strict morning routine. Mm -hmm. So I wake up and I do that every morning from seven to nine. I mean, I do Reiki on myself. I meditate. I really just sit because once my day gets going, I don't have time right. 
Um, but it, again, it's really just making time. Even if I take a trip, like I set that way in advance, you know, I'll yeah. put it in my calendar for two months ahead of time. So that way it is set in place to take care of myself and go on trips. So, yeah, no, I have to do the same thing. And I think that's a good, um, reminder to share because a lot of people, we forget to take care of us. And part of it is like, it's exciting at first you know, because of everything we experience in this work. And I mean, it's really, really exciting. And I think we forget about ourselves sometimes, but I do the same. I have a very um, specific way of starting my day. And if I miss it, because some days I do, it, it totally throws my day. And I'm like, yes, yeah. me too. <laughs> me too. <laughs> have to. like, you do. Ah. You do. And as a sensitive person, which I'm, I'm assuming a lot of people listening are, you know, yeah. they're very in tune to that sort of thing. It's really just recognizing how much you can handle and being okay with setting boundaries for yourself because there's nothing wrong with that. Totally. And I wanted to um, let Jahari know too, like if you want to unmute yourself or turn on your camera, anything at all, feel free if you have questions or something you want to share. And if anyone sees this in the group, the same, you guys can join us or you can type in the chat box. We'll see it um, in the thing, in the Facebook group. Um, there was something else. My mind just went blank of what I wanted to ask you. Oh, working with clients, right? Mm. So a lot of times um, when we start this, I think because in classes it seems like, oh, people come lay on a table and you just put your hands and then, okay, the end. But you start to see the sessions are so much more than that. Um, what have you noticed or do you even have outlined for yourself a way like that you just know like, okay, we're going to start with talking, then energy work, then talking, or how do you facilitate your work? Yeah, I, I have been better with this recently before I wasn't valuing my time. So I would go over time and talk to somebody. But if somebody sets a session for 45 minutes, I end it early, like five minutes early. So we, we can discuss like I, I am totally about sharing, but I actually do an intake form that they fill out beforehand that says, you know, I'm comfortable with you sharing things because <clears throat> sometimes you just never know. I, having that background in social work, so many people experience trauma and you just never, you want to be careful because it's a very intimate setting. And so when somebody comes in, I always pull cards for them before they come. So that way I know what the intention is of this, of the session. And I explain to them, here's what I feel like, you know, is, is my purpose in helping you today. And a lot of times it will resonate. And then I just, I literally explain what I'm going to do. So that way they feel comfortable. And I say, if you need to cry, let it out. Like this is a safe place. So it's really just making people feel safe and comfortable and knowing that they're allowed to, to feel how they need to feel. Yeah, that's a good um, recommendation too. And I, I don't know what you use, so you could tell us, but I have an um, uh, intake form as well. There's actually one that automatically populates when people book a session through my um, scheduler that I use. They have where you can create forms of any questions you want to ask mm -hmm. that'll be sent to you before the session. So I have that. But I also, prior to that, I used, um, there's a site, I believe it's called Wufu. I'll have to look it up. I'll post it on the page in case anyone wants it. But it has um, where you can build forms. So you can build them for free or you can pay to have like some upgraded thing. But I used the free one and you can create a form that has whatever you want on there, like their name, their information. You can have questions, blah, 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 blah. Um, and for people who do readings and these types of things, that form can also say something like, you know, the person is acknowledging that the readings are for entertainment purposes yes. or if you have just yes. any type of things you need to say mm -hmm. um, or that they have to be aware of, you can include it in the form and then there's like an electronic signature of things. So, yeah. Yeah. And I, I will say on top of that too, like even looking at liability insurance, just because you want to, you want to be safe. I do have liability insurance and I had an attorney <clears throat> that I talked to, to just like, you know, go over my form just to see if it, you know, made sense. And yeah, I have all those things on there. Like this is for entertainment purposes. I'm not a medical person, right. you know, so those things are important to have for sure. Yeah. And we actually have um, somewhere posted in the secret circle because 
the Reiki insurance, the liability insurance um, is a great thing to have, like not just for practicing, but even sometimes if people want to rent space for renting for your practice, or if you're running a space just for um, like a class or something, sometimes these places will require that you have that mm -hmm. type of coverage. So um, it's under $200 a year. So, you know, there's links for that on the page for anyone who's interested. And then what was the other thing you said? Oh, also, we've talked about um, people looking to see what the different regulations are in their state, because it does vary by state. Um, let me see, we have someone else joining us. Hi, Don. Um, and for Don and Johari, again, you guys on your devices, you can unmute yourselves and add your video if you like. Um, so yeah, so in the state of California, like we have to have an informed consent. So for in-person sessions, like I have that that people sign. And then I also have the electronic form I was saying on my website for remote sessions. <sighs> Yeah. I know there's just so and honestly there's so many things to learn but I think a lot of times when people are starting off in a business you know my I was making excuses for myself and saying oh well I'm, I'm gonna wait until I have everything perfect and honestly nothing is ever gonna be perfect you learn as you go and you talk to people I think that was one of the big things is just talking to others in my area that kind of did similar things and researching so yeah yeah, that's funny. So I was thinking that um, when I got out of the shower this morning, that exactly like how much we wait <laughs> to just like put ourselves out there. Because I, I know people, I've seen people, I have a friend even who has been doing this for years, but she has a hard time putting herself out there in some ways because she wants everything to be perfect first. Mm -hmm. I'm like, honey, like, just go, just, just go. Do it yeah. and, and you can modify yeah. along the way. Yes. Yeah, one hundred percent. So, did you do that when you first started? Was it kind of just like, okay, I'm going to put this out there, and have you modified a bit as you've gone along? Yeah, when I first started taking people in my home, I I, may, I had a name, you know, I just kind of did whatever, but nothing was perfect. Like I said, I was doing it out of my home, so I didn't have really my own space and. Then from there, though, I was able to start and I really opened my office space without having it totally done. You know, I, there's things that I'm doing all the time to make it better because I think that's in our in this field, you, you want to transform and you want to make your business better, but it's never going to be perfect because you're constantly evolving. Yes. And that's the thing, right? I think that's the big thing is it's going to change and grow with you. Like I think back to what like even offerings I had in the beginning that I don't offer now, or even like the name of my business and that has changed. It it's, it's going to change as you do. So yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. See how that goes. <laughs> um, um, there was something else that you mentioned on the show that I wanted to ask you about. And just a reminder too, for those that are joining, you can, if you're on Facebook, you can type any questions in the chat box or you guys can speak here unmute yourselves if you want to it was something you said about um oh i know i don't know if we talk if we spoke about it on the show but you mentioned it when we spoke beforehand um just having the confidence even to put yourself out there right mm -hmm. and a lot of us have that struggle of what will other people think or say will they think it's legitimate like all of these different things did you come across that and was that something you had to work through? Yeah, I, I think a lot of times it was a lot of people's opinions when I said, oh, I'm starting my own business. And it's kind of an awkward conversation because a lot of people don't understand energy and the Reiki. And so you, you're like, uh, I don't really know how to explain it. So you find a way that that is authentic to who you are, but also helps them understand because I think really part of this business is educating. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't understand the benefits of Reiki. And I actually, I tell a lot of people too, like if you're starting your own business, you know, get a coach, like invest in yourself because yes. you need to be held accountable because for a long time I wasn't. And I was like, Oh, I'll just wait. And then it just kept getting further and further. And so I, I did, I hired a coach and I invested in myself and really just, yeah, I think, I think that was a big part of it. You know, I think it's um, another thing too, is you have to be someone who is willing to be like self-motivated 
because, yeah. you know, I think of, and I was thinking of this the other day too, like with my nine to five, when I worked in corporate, it was like, you had to be at work at a certain time. You had deadlines for certain things. And yes. when you work for yourself, you run the risk of being like too lax, you know, like, mm -hmm. Oh, I could do it later. Oh, blah, blah, blah. But there are a lot of components to this, especially if when you're starting out, if you don't have a team and you're doing it all yourself, that accountability piece is crucial. It is huge. Yeah. And another thing to help with that, I don't know if you do this, Yolanda, but I do a block schedule. So I have my calendar mm -hmm. on Google and I literally just put everything that I'm doing every day. So when it shows up on my notification, even drink water, you know, yeah. I have that on there because life is crazy. Yeah. I have, well, not that detailed, but I do have, um, you know, the blocked time for my morning, like ritual of what I'm going to yes. do. But then there are also different times depending on what I'm working on. Like, for example, when um, on my Patreon group, I added something for them mm -hmm. about uh, just some tips about building your spiritual business. And one of the things I said is like, create a schedule for yourself of every day, like almost like it is your corporate job. Like th yeah. these hours, I'm only going to focus on this, like be committed to doing that. Um, it'll help you so much. But what I also do now is depending on what I'm working on, sometimes I'll have to block time throughout the week just to work on projects. Or sometimes mm -hmm. I'll have to, like you said, schedule ahead where I block a whole day where I'm like, I'm not talking to anybody on this day. <laughs> like yeah. I need a day just for me and self-care because honestly, a lot of times my work will even bleed over into the weekends. And yes. so I have to, um, yeah, schedule time where it's just, I got to take care of me. Yeah. And I was, I think going off of that, I was listening to an audio book and they, you know, they were talking about every time you say yes to something that doesn't rate with, resonate with you, you're saying no to mm -hmm. spending the time that you need for your business and things that make you happy. So as people pleasers, as sensitive souls, like yeah. again, those boundaries and just recognizing what fits for you and what feels good for you and going from that space. Yeah. I think that's probably one of the biggest ones is learning to say no. And yep. like I said, for me, it took me getting burnt out to get, you know, hit the point of like, no, I have to say no, or like yeah. I have to have space where I'm, I'm just, I'm done. But yeah, I think it's a really hard one, especially for healers because of that level of like just wanting to support. And I think there's a part of us too, especially people who are like very sensitive and maybe we grew up, um, Mm, internalizing a lot because of our sensitivities. And I think there's something like in our subconscious where we don't want other people to feel isolated or alone. Mm -hmm. So we like really will go out of the way to make sure people feel supported in ways where maybe we didn't. Yes. <laughs> 100%. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, I have to ask you this because this comes up in the group a lot too. Um, preparing your space or people have um, oftentimes fears around the exchange of energy in sessions, mm. right? So say <clears throat> someone comes in and their energy is like really heavy and a lot of people will have um, some fear around that, especially if they're empaths are like, I don't want to take that crap on. Um, so I always tell people like, that's why managing your own energy is so important, but how do you navigate that? What works for you? Honestly, the one thing that I have found, well, a couple things, I get ready an hour beforehand. Mm -hmm. Like I truly just make sure my energy is balanced. I balance my chakras, give myself Reiki, do all those things beforehand and then get into my space and cleanse it before they get there. And I just say, you know, the energy that is no longer serving this person, please let it release from them because I don't look at energy as really good or bad. It's mm -hmm. for our highest good, but mm -hmm. some energy just sticks and it doesn't need to be there anymore. Yep. So I, I do a lot of that beforehand. And then I, yeah, when they come in, I just set the intention and I tell them like, this is a safe space. We're going to release, like, you know, let yourself cry, let yourself do whatever you need to do. And then if you tend to feel that, you know, even just picture yourself grounded, like your feet, you know, the roots coming out of your feet. It really just depends. But for me, it's the prepping beforehand and cleansing it afterwards. That makes yes. sense. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yes. That should be like 
just on all of our walls, like don't forget to come back into yourself and clear your space after the fact. But yeah, I do the same thing. So I prepare um, for myself, but I also, it's, I think it's really big to um, prepare the energy of the space for you know what it is you're going to do. I remember I used to also um, intend to have almost like this, um, like an energetic screen in the doorway mm -hmm. so that when people were coming into the space, they were already like stepping into a healing space, like getting like a cleansing just through walking yes. through the doorway. Um, but you reminded me, another good tip for people is to have a buffer in between sessions. Like you yeah. need that space in between to You do. Yeah. Even, you know, an hour or a couple hours, but yeah, because people are, I originally thought, oh, well, I'll do session after session. And I was like, after doing that once, <laughs> I will never do it again. Ever. Yeah. And if you have a scheduler, they usually have where you can put it in yeah. where it automatically puts a buffer time in between what people can book for you. Um, speaking of that, have you come to a place of noticing your maximum amount of sessions you can do a day. Cause that was something I kind of learned the hard way too. I think for me, I would say like two, two or three max, just because it takes so much out of me. I did a yoga event where I did 10 minutes of Reiki and there was six people, I think. And that was so depleting. Yeah, because it was just one after another and I couldn't even prep or anything like that. And I, again, I said, I'm never going to do that, do that again. Yeah. And the funny thing about it is because a lot of times people don't recognize it until the day is over. Because yes. if you're like staying in the state of like lifted and you're, it's almost like energetically you're supported in doing the work, but when that day ends, there's like something you will just like crash and be done. Yeah. So I, um, in terms of one-to-one -one sessions, I have a max for myself of three a day. That's it. Mm -hmm. And then I have other stuff, of course I do in between, but that's all I can do a day in terms of one-on-one -on -one because of that, having that experience. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it honestly, too, for me, it's not about the time. It's like three max. It doesn't matter right. if it's an hour or 30 minutes. It's still the same amount of energy that you're giving. Yeah. So yeah, three is my max. Yeah. How do you, what is your um, practice for ending sessions? Like, do you do something um, to ground after every session? And then do you do something very specific at the end of the day for yourself? Like, how do you make sure you reconnect? Yeah, after they are out of my office, you know, I wake them up, I t or I tell them, you know, what was happening at during the session, I cleanse the space, I release all the energy, and then I try to remember to wash, like, my hands because mm -hmm. water is so cleansing and really putting Reiki on my wrists because mm -hmm. I feel like so many massage therapists and Reiki practitioners, they carry it in their wrists. Yes. So I do that, and then I really just visualize my space, visualize how I want the rest of my day to go, and then kind of go from there. But at the end of the day, I really try to drink a lot of water. I mean – because it, it just takes a lot out of me. Yeah. You just reminded me of two. Um, I think, uh, I don't know how many teachers, but somewhere, some of my Reiki training somewhere, they teach something called Kinyoku, which is like dry bathing. And part of it is like you're wiping off, but you also go down the arms. And so that's yes. always something I tell people too. Like you want to make sure to like clear those energy channels in your arms. Uh, do you ever catch yourself like, yeah. Yes. Just automatically when I'm done yep. working, I'm just, I don't even have to think about it. It's like my something in me just knows like, ugh, okay. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think too, for a lot of people, it's really just finding to what works for them. Like it's yes. your automatic, your body will let you know how you need to release it. Like some people yawn, some people cough, you know, like whatever. So, but for me, it's literally just like the, the hand movements. Yeah. That's, um, that's the thing too, I think is a big one is reminding everybody to trust how you're guided because we share stories, of course, and we share in these ways so that we can all support each other and all of these things. But the truth is you will be guided to do certain things in a way that is just, it's just your way. 
So yeah. speaking of that, um, you took Holy Fire Reiki, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not familiar. I, I haven't taken it, but regardless, no matter what type of Reiki you take, did you notice once you started practicing that you were kind of guided to work in a particular way? And does that differ session to session or are you pretty like have a standardized flow? I think that when I, so when I took Holy Fire Reiki, they taught us about crystals and how you can make crystal grids. And then Holy Fire too, I believe is like a lot of the past life stuff. So when I did Reiki before getting my Holy Fire, I did it very strictly. Like I would do the certain hand placements, like no question. But then when I got that, it was more of a flow. It was more of just like me tapping into what the person needs. Sometimes I'm on their back for longer. Or sometimes they need it on their feet. So really, I just intuitively feel what they need now as compared to before. Yeah, I think that, um, well, that's what I did too. And I think the thing with that is sometimes when we're trying to um, – get it right like you know follow a particular form of like i don't know just yeah. to do something right we often disconnect from the work itself because we're so in our head and so it can be really helpful to you know practice just letting yourself be guided so that you can remain in that connection with whomever you're working on rather than trying to keep up with if you're right or wrong absolutely you're doing it yeah yep <laughs> <laughs> so have you noticed that anything has cracked open for you? Like since you've been practicing, have you been more sensitive? Are you perceiving things differently? Like what's, what has changed if anything? I think that for me, when I'm practicing Reiki now, I'm able to connect more to the ancestor stuff and like the angels. And before I, when I kind of started opening up, my main modality was like mediumship. You know, I would get a lot of spirits coming through. And I think a lot of times people will start with that, but then it evolves, you know? So it's not just people that have passed over it. Well, as when I do Reiki, sometimes people do, but more so now I feel more in like the angels and the saints and, you know, that realm. So that for me has opened a lot. Well, I have to ask you this because this I think is really interesting and it was true for me too. I didn't necessarily have any particular thing that I wanted to open up to. It's just things kept happening and it kept changing as I continued to practice. So very similar to what you said, like, you know, um, I think initially I would see things like in people's bodies or in their space. And then it evolved or switched to, then I saw like all of these guides in the room and they would be like around mm -hmm. the table. And then I'd go through like this other phase where it would change and, you know, it just kept, and I felt like I was just watching or being yes, almost like educated by the process by being in it. Yes. So, is that what happened for you? Yeah, I think, yeah, it's very similar because when I first started doing Reiki, I would get a lot of, you know, people, that have crossed over, but then it really switched into more of like a medical intuitive where I would see their thyroid light up or, you know, whatever was going on. And that sometimes will happen now, but more so now, like I did a Reiki session today and it was just, I saw people, like I literally just felt all of these people in the room around the table, placing right. their hands. And it's, it's beautiful because it's a collaborative effort, I yes. feel. And you're more attuned to that, you know, the more like the master level, I feel like that opened a lot more. Well, I want to ask you about that then too, because I, what I noticed was looking back now, Reiki level one, I, I don't know that anything was that obvious to me other than like, I had the experience of like, yes, I felt energy coming from my hands. Sometimes I felt like it did. Sometimes I felt like it didn't like, you know, it wasn't, nothing was really clear. It was just like, mm -hmm. yeah, I definitely am having an experience, but I'm really not sure what's going on. And then when I did um, level two, something shifted and it felt like, oh my God, I'm seeing everything differently. Like my understanding of life myself, like everything is starting to shift. So it, then it started to become very clear that my perceptions were changing um, yeah. and how I 
just what I thought about and how I saw things. And then after um, master level, I think one of the first things I noticed was I finally started to become more vulnerable with myself mm-hmm. and like more compassionate with myself. It, it, I feel like I went even more into, whereas one and two, I was like, I want to help you over there. And yeah. master level, it was like, whoa, lady, like yes. look in the mirror. That's what happened to me. Yep. So what was your, did you notice anything different through the levels? Yeah, honestly, kind of the same thing that you were talking about. I, I truly think that I went into level one because at the time I was in school and I thought, oh, this would be a really cool certificate. Like people are really into themselves like, oh, I have the certificate. So right. I think I went into it for the wrong reasons at first. But then when I learned about it, then my level two, I was more intentional. I was more of like, let me learn level one. Right. And really focus on that and then go into level two. Whereas before I would have just been like, oh, let's just get it done so I can have certificates. But it's yeah. about that energy and about you working on yourself and the master level. I really started to focus on that self-compassion and really just working on the shadow work. And yeah. that came about, you know, pretty recently after I took my master level. Yeah. And that's one of the things with it. Um, now, I mean, I didn't know before, but now I do. And even when people think like, oh, I don't want to teach, should I take master level? And I'm like, yeah, if you want to keep going deeper into your self work, yeah, there is something, it's very interesting, just the way like we progress through it. Right. And we continue to shift and change. We continue to shift and change. Although, um, another thing I've noticed as well, and why I always tell people practice your practice this kind of goes in line with like where people ask about, you know, I want a teacher who is like, you know, I don't know, like very close to Yusui and lineage. Um, what I have seen is I've met people who have practiced or been attuned to Reiki, I should say, for over 20 years. And then I could see someone who's been practicing for like a year. And the difference is not in who their teachers were or how long ago their attunements were. It really speaks to how connected that person is to their practice. Well, yes. If they were willing to go into their own self-work. That's what yes. makes like the biggest difference. Yeah. And I will, I will say to a lot of people, I feel like in the spiritual community can be very ego-based because it's a very powerful thing and there's nothing yeah. wrong with it, but you know, you want to find somebody to who resonates with you because there's so many practitioners out there. And I tell that to my clients, even I say like, there might be a day where you don't resonate with me. And you know what, that's okay, because that means you're evolving. Like, and I, as a social worker, I always said, I want to work myself out of a job, because Mm -hmm. that means that you're getting better. And I don't want to see you. (laughs) you there's a um yesterday two friends of mine they also do all of this and um we did a podcast together so it won't air until monday but one of them she was saying how she got so pissed at me one day because she wanted me to like read her space or do something and i was like no you'll figure it out and she was so mad at me but the reason i did it was because i knew like she had the capacity and the ability to do it you know yeah. and that's one of the things I think um, is so big too. Like, again, no matter how much we encourage each other and support each other, I think uh, it's great if you're teaching or sharing, or if you are looking for a teacher, definitely find someone who is going to show you that you can, like show you that it's you, empower you so that you don't become dependent on thinking that they're the ones that can fix you or make it right. Like really having this, process of experiencing what it's like to do it for yourself. Yeah. And that's going off of that too. In my sessions before, when they first come in, I do say, you know, this is not, it has nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. This is all about your healing. You know, I'm just a vessel. I'm literally a conduit of energy. So I'm like, this isn't going to fix you. This takes a lot of work and it's not a one one thing fits all for every person. So you just have to be honest with that. Did you have the experience of like hitting a wall in this? So, you know, you hear a lot of people talk about like the dark night of the soul or um, after being attuned, some people feel it right away. Some people it takes some time, but a lot of people talk about 
hitting this point where it's almost like something erupts. And I don't know if it's because finally of like what's moving and you just move into this different space. Did you have a phase in this where you hit a big level of discomfort? Yeah, I, I'm i trying to remember if I was attuned to my master. It might have just been level two, but it was this weird phase in my life. This was four years ago. My brother had just left for the military. You know, I had started a new relationship, but I was actually really sick for like six months, which I talked about that before. And I had gone to all these doctors. They gave me all these different diagnoses, but I literally felt so miserable. I felt mm-hmm. awful. And I had learned Reiki and I actually said, you know what, I'm going to heal myself. I don't, don't know how, but I did Reiki on myself pretty much every single day for six months. And wow. I started eating really clean and literally all of my symptoms were just gone in that time. And so I think that that was kind of my wall, but it showed me that Reiki is so powerful to be able to clear that stuff out. I mean, I'm sure there were other things on top of that that helped, but really Reiki is is amazing. It really, really is. Um, I think that's one of the things I think the biggest gift of this work has shown me. Um, just like, I feel like it's not even the full capacity, but just like a little peek at what we're capable of, you know, just how dynamic we are. And I'm constantly amazed by us and what we can do. And when we do these practices and the different experiences it brings us into. So like, what you're saying, I have to ask you this, when you started um, doing sessions and seeing things like people who had crossed over, seeing guides and all of this, was there something in you that doubted it at first? And was there anything where you finally were like, this has to be true? Like, I can't be making this up. Yeah. When I started opening up, it was actually another transition and it was my going into my freshman year of college. And that's when I really started opening up to like the mediumship stuff. And I honestly thought, because and I think in our society, it's like, if you start seeing things, people are easy to assume, oh, well, you have schizophrenia or right. you're bipolar, like all of these other things when really you're just opening up. And so I was really scared because I you know, I'm all about the holistic. I get people need medication, but that is just not something that resonates with me. Mm -hmm. So I, I went to a medium and she, I had said nothing to her about anything that was happening. And, you know, she said, I want you to know that this is you opening up, but I hadn't, I hadn't even told her anything. And I, that's kind of what started. And then the Reiki happened. And I, I felt like, because I had Reiki as a tool in my toolbox, yeah. I was then able to understand that I wasn't crazy or, you know, it was a legitimate thing and to be confident and know that it's coming from a place for the highest good for whoever I'm doing Reiki on. Yeah. That's the thing too. I, I'm glad you said that. I think that's why these conversations are so important and especially in these spaces of community. So as people have these experiences, especially if they're new, like they haven't had it before. I mean, could you imagine if you (laughs) never saw anything or never like felt energy so intensely and then all of a sudden that starts to happen. And if you don't have anyone in your life that you feel comfortable to share that with because you don't want to be judged, that can be hard. It can be really, really hard. So I think these conversations are so important so that we do know like, yeah, no, there's nothing wrong with you. This is what's happening. And these are some ways that you can support yourself through the process. Absolutely. Yeah. So with that said, like, is there something for you that you would recommend for people? Two things. One, if people are, um, trying to feel more comfortable in their sensitivity? Is there anything you recommend? And then also, um, did you do any training or something or have you just allowed yourself to kind of figure out how you work? So the first one, as far as recommending to really help people step in their power is I used to do this all the time without even realizing it. I would literally look at myself in in a mirror, look at myself in my eyes and ask myself, what is the life that I want? Mm -hmm. 
you know, and in using positive affirmations and saying, you know, you are supported, you are loved, you know, and even reaching out to other people too. I think that's huge because we can learn from so many people who are doing similar things. And I think that for me, asking for help for a long time was really hard for me to do. But then once I did it more, I got to meet so many beautiful people who shared stories of how, you know, how to have a business or how to be confident in yourself. And to like, even if you need to see a therapist, like yes. talk about those things, because I you know, had seen a therapist who's very spiritual. We used tuning forks. We did meditation. Like it was beautiful. So I think finding ways to empower yourself and balance your energy system whether that's going out in nature. So a combination of different things, really. Mm -hmm. And then the second question, what did you ask? I asked you, I'm sorry, I, got, I was having visuals of what you were describing right there. Oh, oh, did you teach yourself like just through the process of how you were opening up or did you take classes or things to support you in understanding? Yeah, I took... As far as classes go, I took a class on life coaching. It was a, a year long process and it was a spiritual life coaching. So that really helped me figure out who I wanted to serve, those sorts of things. And then um, I'm trying to think of what other, obviously like the Reiki classes, anything on YouTube about like even vlogs, I would just look up you know, people talking about Reiki or, or different things like that. And then we, I don't know if you've heard of Lilydale, Lilydale. Oh, that is, place, the mediumship, like house. Yeah. In York. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's not that far away. And I went to Lilydale for a couple classes about, you know, opening up and really just how to balance. So they would have workshops, but really anything that resonates. How was it there? What was the, it's amazing. Like? Yeah. It, it can, your first time it's a little overwhelming, but, and it depends on who you book sessions with, but it's, it's neat. I don't know. I, I like, <laughs> I like going. I heard of them because I think there's like an annual event or something that they mm -hmm. do that a lot of people come to from all over the place. Yeah. So I, I heard of it a few years ago and yeah, I'll have to look that up again. It's neat. Yeah, I did the same thing though. So one thing you reminded me about with the mirror, but um, that's why I ended up taking like intuitive development classes. A friend of mine and I did mediumship classes and I took so many different things um, for different reasons. Some things I took because I wanted to be able to um, be more comfortable in how I was holding space in sessions. So in part, it was because of the support I wanted to provide to other people. But um, some of the things I took was just for my own level of comfort. So for example, like when I was feeling energy, but didn't know how to translate it, it was unnerving. So I had to do something like the intuition, mediumship, these things, because I wanted to be able to translate and know what was around me. And I wanted to understand like, yeah. how can I feel safe in my own being when I'm interacting with these different type of energies. And it was invaluable because as you do open up more and more, you do have some really interesting experiences from, you know, different things that people may be carrying in their spaces, a, a yeah. lot of things and giving myself that opportunity to continue to learn and educate myself was priceless. Yeah. And I think kind of too off of what you were saying on top of that is having a mentor to talk to because yeah. sometimes you really run into a lot of ethical dilemmas. And I'm very blessed because as a social worker, we, I learned a lot about that, but yes. having somebody to talk to about trauma or you have clients coming in with a mental health diagnosis, like how do you handle it? Like there's so many things that people bring because they want to be healed. Yes. But you know, we have to be honest with ourselves and also reaching out for support to have a mentor to talk to. And knowing sometimes that some people, they're just not maybe well suited to work yeah. with, you know, there have been people where it's been like, you know, I think maybe you would be better working with someone else or these types of things. Yes. And like knowing that we not we aren't necessarily equipped to support everybody because yeah. people have different 
levels of needs. And yeah, we have to be honest about that. But the mirror thing you said, um, <laughs> I, first of all, I, I'm not a fan of mirrors ever since I saw like poltergeist when I was little. So like mirrors, I'm just like, Nope. I, I, don't, I barely like only time I'm really in the mirror is if I'm doing makeup and that is yeah. it. Like makeup and I'm gone. Like I don't want anything to do with a mirror, but there was this one day, um, I forget. It might've been after my yoga teacher training. I don't know, but there were, uh, in my yoga teacher training at the Chopra Center, a few events I had gone to where they make you like look at someone, like hold mm. their hands and just look into each other's eyes for like too long. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a really yep. long time, but it's an amazing exercise. Like yep. I, actually one of my favorite things. So this one day I thought like, I'm going to go in the mirror and I'm going to just look in my own eyes and ask my intention was to see myself like my true essence, like see myself mm. beyond my person, see myself beyond like everything. Right. So I was sitting in the mirror and I was just like, had a very soft gaze staring at myself. And I was just saying like, allow me to see myself. I don't remember if I said like in truth or as I am, whatever it was, but I just kept that. And it was the craziest thing. Cause my face started shifting and mm. then like tears just started coming out. It was crazy experience, but I don't know. Um, I don't want to say your name wrong. Sunaya? I hope I didn't say that wrong. She said, is this the same Emily that was on the recent podcast? Yes. Yes. It is, it is me in the flesh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that's why I wanted to invite her here um, because so much of her story I know is like very supportive and familiar to what so many of us are going through. Um, if you have any questions for her, type it away because we're almost done here. Um, I have to ask you this too, since we're here. When you talk about Reiki or all the things that you practice, like whether to yourself or maybe sharing with your husband, like what have been some of the highlights for you? Like, is, is there anything that stands out that you're like, this has been such a gift because? Yeah. So it's funny because for me, I really do think it helps strengthen relationships, which, which sounds crazy, but with, you know, being married and having like a fur baby, you know, all of these different things, you can really pick up on energy. So my husband, you know, if he comes home from work, I'm able to really feel what's going on. And that really leads into an open discussion of, t you know, tell me what's going on. And sometimes he won't know until like later on that yes. you like sense it. <laughs> yeah. Like, how did you know? You know, but um, yeah, I really do. I think that overall, like the positive things are really just having that sense of knowing and trusting and then being able to talk about it because yeah. communication is like everything. That is so true. Um, that's actually highlighted for me this year, um, looking at how this work has supported me in relationship and like any of my relationships, because I was more, um, again, like I internalized a lot and I, mm -hmm. I don't know, I just wasn't that open. Like people could tell me things, but I didn't necessarily share. Right. Whereas now I'm more inclined to do the same. And I wouldn't ask people what was going on. Like I didn't want to pry. Whereas now I'm like, yeah. Oh, what's going on with you? How are you feeling? Are yes. you okay? You know? So I do ask more. I do check in more when I notice someone may seem like something's off, but I'm also more open myself. And I think the only reason I'm able to do that um, because of this work, it helped me to manage my own emotions and manage like my own level of vulnerability and like the way I perceive things. So again, like say for example, in exchange with someone, if they say something that triggers you and then you're like, God knows how to <laughs> react. Right. Whereas now I am like very aware and accountable for what I feel and what's coming up for me. And it's, it's like almost automatic now, like real time in my mind, I'm like talking myself through it and analyze like, wait, what is this hitting? Like, why do you feel this way? But yeah, that it's my feeling, you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, it has helped a lot in relationship and, and communication. Yeah. 
And I think too, being able to understand if it is yours, Reiki yes. helps you kind of decipher if you're feeling it for you or you're feeling it for somebody else. And that's, that's huge. Yeah. That's why this is so good for people who are very empathic because I think of how I used to hate being in certain environments and didn't know why. Mm -hmm. And now I send stuff and I'm like, Oh, but I know it's not me. So I can manage it. However I manage it. Um, Sue Enya, she said she just listened to the show today. Oh, yeah. I hope you liked it. Getting a double dose of Emily today. Double dose. <laughs> so much Emily. Yes, so much Emily. But I'm so glad um, that you came in and that we get to see you now because we weren't able to use the video from the podcast. So I can't thank you enough yeah. for like coming and chatting with us. Um, one last thing I wanted to ask you because you gone through it for anyone who is in that space. And I know you said you stayed with your um, social work and allowed yourself to build up your clientele before you transitioned. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any advice for people who are, say they've already are moving into the space of like, oh, I want to run a space or how do I get clients? Like, what do I do? Was there anything that you did that was helpful, especially with like getting your name out there or having people even know that you did what you do? I, yeah. So in my area, we had a, like a business program that was called co-starters. And I don't know if it's in your guys's areas, but it was a business class to kind of help you get your ideas together. And that's kind of, I mean, I wouldn't say that shifted it, but that definitely helped me meet more people and learn about how to even start a business because so many people, I don't know. And I think, I don't know, I'm like switching the subject a little bit, but with business, I think that as a spiritual person, you need to find somebody that you can talk to that kind of has that similar background. Because when you look at a typical business model, it's really not incorporating the spiritual component. So when I hired my coach, you know, she built her spiritual business and she talked a lot about, you know, your relationship with money and the manifestation and all of those different things. So I think that one is a big thing. And that goes along with having a mentor as well. And really just talking to people and explaining in ways that they understand Reiki. So I always say it's like an energetic massage kind of, and everyone experiences it differently. So the education is key. Yes. Getting yourself out there in a way that feels authentic for you and trusting that you don't have to be like somebody else to succeed. Right. It's owning your own power. Ah, that's a beautiful way to put it. Uh, um, it's funny. Three things are going through my head. I, I just remembered a, a years ago, I created a online, um, it was a free webinar. I'll have to find it. If I find it, I'll put it in the secret circle for you guys. But it was just about that. And it was looking at our chakra energy, mm. very related to our business and like our practice. And so like going, looking at what you're holding energetically and coming into alignment with your business and your practice. I'll have to look that up and find it for you guys. But yeah, that's really, really good advice. And again, can't thank you enough. Um, if you guys watch this later, because I know people are in all different time zones. If you have any questions or anything resonates with you after the fact, just put it in the comments. And yeah. Thank you so Bye. much for welcoming, welcoming me into the space. This is, oh. this is beautiful. Of course. Wait, I just remembered because I yes. said on the thing that your Instagram was seek solace it's seeking solace yes. and it's s-o-u-l-a-c-e yes underscore with emily so that's yes. her um instagram tag if you want to stay connected and then your website is also seeking solace s-o-u-l-a-c-e dot com so be yes. sure to reach out to emily <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you love thank you for being here yes thank you bye Sue Enya that's a really pretty name by the way I love it and thank you love for it. Jahari and Emily oh you're Emily what am I saying Don <laughs> for coming on here with us today bye Yolanda bye love bye